Well, good evening, people of God. It's good to be with you once again and to open God's word together to end this day in God's presence the way we began it. And so our God calls us to his worship once again this evening with these words from Psalm 95, verses 1 through 3. Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise, for the Lord is a great God, a great King above all gods. People of God, the Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him with truth, in truth, and he greets us this evening with these words from the book of the Revelation. Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is coming, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings on earth. Amen. Let's pray together and ask God to bless our time this evening. Let's pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you are always more ready to hear than we are to pray and to give more than we desire or deserve. Pour down now upon us the abundance of your mercy, forgiving us those things of which our conscience is convicted and giving us those good things for which we are not worthy to ask except through the merits and mediation of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Well, this evening for our Confession of Faith, we're going to return again to Belgic Confession Article 1. Belgic Confession Article 1. And I want to read that as our Confession of Faith together. Well, this is our Confession of Faith. We all believe in our hearts and confess with our mouths that there is a single and simple spiritual being whom we call God, eternal, incomprehensible, invisible, unchangeable, infinite, almighty, completely wise, just, and good, and the overflowing source of all good. That's our confession of faith and the article of faith that we want to consider together this evening. But before we do that, let's go to our God once again in a time of evening prayer, um, as has been our 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 particular practice through uh, this pandemic. We'll use one of our prayers for the sick and for the spiritually distressed and end our prayer with the Lord's Prayer together. So let's pray. Eternal and merciful God and Father, the eternal salvation of the living and the eternal life of the dying, you alone have life and death in your hands. You continually care for us in such a way that neither health nor sickness Neither good nor evil can befall us. Indeed, not even a hair can fall from our heads without your will. You order all things for the good of believers. We ask that you will grant us the grace of the Holy Spirit, that he may teach us to truly know our miseries and to bear patiently your chastisements, which as far as our merits are concerned might have been 10,000 times more severe. We know that they are not tokens of your wrath, but of your fatherly love for us that we might not be condemned with the world. Increase our faith by your Holy Spirit, that we may become more and more united with Christ, to whom you desire to conform us, both in suffering and in glory. Lighten our cross so that we in our weakness may be able to bear it. We submit ourselves without reserve to your holy will, whether you leave our souls here in these earthly tents or whether you take them home to yourself. We know we need have no fear because we belong to Christ and therefore shall not perish. We even desire to depart from this weak body in the hope of a blessed resurrection, knowing that then it will be restored to us in a much more glorious form. Grant that we may experience the blessed comfort of the remission of sins and of justification in Christ. May we with that defense overcome all the assaults of Satan, and may Christ's innocent blood wash away our stain, and may his righteousness cover our unrighteousness in your final judgment. Arm us with faith and hope that we may not be put to shame by any fear of death. May may the eyes of our soul be fixed upon you when the eyes of our body become dim. Should you take from us the power of speech, May our hearts never cease to call upon you. O Lord, we commit our souls into your hands. Do not forsake us in the hour of death. This we pray only for the sake of Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. We're going to turn together to Psalm 104. Uh, to consider the glories of our God. But before we turn to Psalm 104 together, let's pray a prayer of illumination taken from Psalm 43. Let's pray. Father in heaven, by your spirit through the word, send out your light and your truth. Let them lead us. Let them bring us to your holy hill and to your dwelling. Then we will come to the cross of Christ, the Son of God, our exceeding joy. And we will praise you, O triune God, our God. Hear us, for we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's turn together, as I said, to Psalm 104. As we think about uh, Belgic Confession, Article 1, we want to think about Psalm 104 together. A psalm that testifies to the greatness of our God. Let's pay careful attention, for this is God's own word. Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord, my God, you are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty, covering yourself with light as with a garment, stretching out the heavens like a tent. He lays the beams of his chambers on the waters. He makes the clouds his chariot. He rides on the wings of the wind. He makes his messengers winds, his ministers a flaming fire. He set the earth on its foundation so that it should never be moved. You covered it with a deep as with a garment. The waters stood above the mountains. At your rebuke they fled. At the sound of your thunder they took flight. The mountains rose, the valleys sank down to the place that you appointed for them. You set a boundary that they may not pass, so they might not again cover the earth. You make springs gush forth in the valleys. They flow between the hills. They give drink to every beast of the field. The wild donkeys quench their thirst. Beside them the birds of the heavens dwell, they sing among the branches. From your lofty abode you water the mountains, the earth is satisfied with the fruit of your work. You cause the grass to grow for the livestock, and plants for man to cultivate, that he may bring forth food from the earth, and wine to gladden the heart of man, oil to make his face shine, and bread to strengthen a man's heart. The trees of the Lord are watered abundantly, cedars of Lebanon that he planted. In them the birds build their nests, the stork has her home in the fir trees. The high mountains are for the wild goats, the rocks are a refuge for the rock badgers. He made the moon to mark the seasons. The sun knows it's time for setting. You make darkness and it is night when all the beasts of the forest creep about. Young lions roar for their prey, seeking their food from God. When the sun rises, they steal away and lie down in their dens. Man goes out to his work and to his labor until the evening. O Lord, how manifold are your works. In wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. Here is the sea, great and wide, which teems with creatures innumerable, living things, both small and great. There go the ships and Leviathan, which you formed to play in it. These all look to you to give them their food in due season. When you give it to them, they gather it up. When you open your hand, they are filled with good things. When you hide your face, they are dismayed. When you take away their breath, they die and return to their dust. When you send forth your spirit, they are created, and you renew the face of the ground. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works, who looks on the earth and it trembles, who touches the mountains and they smoke. I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have being. May my meditation be pleasing to him. For I rejoice in the Lord. Let sinners be consumed from the earth. Let the wicked be no more. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Praise the Lord. 
Amen. So far the reading of God's word. May he bless it to us. Well, this is a psalm that communicates to us in so many ways from the manifold works of God, how many are his wonderful attributes. We want to continue to think of what Belgic Confession Article 1 tells us about our God, uh, those things that are true about him and so many of those things that Article 1 speaks about, we see in the works of God as, as outpourings of who he is and help us to learn something about him. So last time we talked about God's being, um, what God is, we might say. Uh, we want to say that with reverence, but we, we say, what is God? What, what does it mean to be God? And we reminded ourselves from the Belgian Confession that God is one. There is only one unique God, that he is simple. He's not made up of parts um, like we are, body and soul. There is one God without parts or divisions, that God is spiritual, that he is not made of any created substance, that he is not made of any material, he is invisible, um, he is without composition, without things making him up, um, he's without extension, without space in the world, he is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. We've learned something of the being of God, what God is. Um, but that's not enough to tell us who God is um, in, the many, in the many ways he's revealed himself in Scripture. Um, that's not enough to know his name. Uh, that's not enough to know what God is like. And you can sort of put this way. Imagine you were, you were one of your friends tells you that they've, they've met someone and they've started dating and, and they're going on and on about this person that they're dating. And you say, well, well tell me something about this person. And and so your friend says, well, um, she's female. Uh, this is her height. This is her weight. This is her hair, hair and eye color. Um, this is her age. And that's all they said. It's kind of the bare description. Um, you, would, you would say to your friend, well, that, that doesn't really tell me anything about her. Um, I'm not interested in putting out a, you know, a police APB on her. Um, that doesn't tell me anything about who she is. You haven't told me her name. You've described her. But what is she like? Right? You'd want, you'd want some details. Um, you'd want to know, what, what is this person like? That would help you know them better, to know their name, uh, to know their attributes. What are, what are they like? Are they, are they funny? Are they kind? Are they loving? Then we would get, be getting into what, what they're like, some of their, what we would call attributes, Right? Um, and that's what we want to do in the Belgian Confession. It wouldn't be enough for us to say, who is God? And just say, well, God is one only simple spiritual being. Well, that tells us what God is, but it doesn't tell us much about who he is. Right? It, it's, it's not his name. It's not his attributes. And that's what the Belgian Confession goes on to say. We, we confess and believe in our hearts not just in a being, but a being whose name we know and whose attributes we know. And that helps us to begin to fill out the picture of the God we serve. That's why, why this whole article is important, why Psalms like Psalm 104 are important, because what God does tells us about who God is. Who is this person that we call, who is this being that we call God? One in essence and three in person. Who is this God? What do we know about him? And we want to think a little bit about the name of God and about the attributes of God as they are spelled out here in the Belgic Confession. We all believe in our hearts and confess with our mouths that there is a single and simple spiritual being whom we call God. Um, we learn something about him from his name that he's revealed to us. Well, why do we call him God? Why don't we call him something else? Well, because that's how he's revealed himself to us in his word. Right? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. We're immediately introduced to this being that we call God. And the names which we learn about him in Scripture tell us something about him. 
that he is the high and exalted one who transcends everything else. So the scriptures call him God, El in Hebrew. He's strong and mighty to be feared. He is the Lord, Adonai, owner and ruler of all things. He is the Most High, Elyon, exalted above all and the object of all reverence and worship. Each one of those things tells us something about our God. His names tell us something. That he's the high and exalted one who transcends all else. But his name tells us more than just that he's high and exalted, but this one that who is high and exalted has entered into a relationship with his people. In Exodus 6.3, he says, I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty. But by my name, the Lord, I did not make myself known to them. God is making his name known to them now as the Lord. But both of those names are important. God says, I appeared to Abraham as God Almighty, El Shaddai, the exalted one who is mighty for his people. Right? Not just almighty and exalted, but exalted and almighty for his people. El Shaddai, that he is the Lord. Yahweh, that covenant name that he reveals to his own. In other passages, he will describe himself as Yahweh Sabaoth, the Lord of hosts. Um, maybe, maybe you've wondered that from time to time when you're singing Martin Luther's famous hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. And we sing that verse, did we in our own strength confide our striving would be losing? We're not the right man on our side, the man of God's own choosing. Dost ask who that may be? Christ Jesus, it is he. Lord Sabaoth, his name. From age to age the same, and he must win the battle. What does Lord Sabaoth mean? It means Lord of hosts, Lord of armies. That's the power of the Lord and for his people, Yahweh Sabaoth, the Lord for his people, the Lord of armies in command for his people. That name tells us something about our God. But we might say finally, the most important name that God has in all of scriptures for his people is Father. But in the Old Testament, God is presented to us as the Father of Israel. Um, for you are our father, we read in Exodus 6, uh, I'm sorry, Isaiah 63, 16. For you are our father, though Abraham does not know us, and Israel does not acknowledge us. You, O Lord, are our father, our redeemer from old is your name. And in the New Testament, it comes to us in even further clarity because we understand that God is our father for Christ's sake. God is presented as father of all those who are part of the true Israel by the person and work of the Lord Jesus and faith in him. As we read in John 1, 12 and 13, but all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God, who can call him Abba, Father. Um, that, that's a unique relationship. And so we've learned something about God by his names. He is high and, and exalted. He transcends all else. He's mighty, but mighty for his people, that he's committed himself in covenant as the covenant God who is mighty for his people, who is our Father for Christ's sake. We call him God. We know something about him from his name. That he is exalted, he's almighty, he's the covenant God, he is our father. And we learn more about him through the attributes or the perfections of God that we are revealed that are revealed to us in creation and in the world. In the world, I mean the creation and in the word. Um, all of these, all of these many attributes that are ascribed to God in Article 1 of the Belgic Confession are all ascribed to God in Scripture. They are visibly exercised by him in the works of creation and providence and redemption. Uh, we learn about who God is by what God does. And usually when we talk about the attributes of God, we talk about the incommunicable attributes and the communicable attributes. 
Now, those are long and fancy sounding words, um, but what, what do we mean by separating those two things? Well, we say there are some attributes for which there is some analogy in us. Um, that when we say, for example, that God is loving, that we know something of what it is to be loving. Uh, we don't know what it is to be loving as God is loving, uh, but we know something of what it is to be loving. There's some analogy of that in us. Those are the communicable attributes. There's some analogy of that in us. So we talk about the complete wisdom of God. We, we understand something of what it is to be wise. We can have some sense of that in our own lives. We're never as wise as God is wise. And we're never wise like God is wise. Um, but we have some analogy of that in us. And that's how we separate the, analogy, the attributes of God. Those for which there are no analogy in us. Um, we say God is invisible. There's no sense in which I'm invisible. There's no analogy of that in me. Um, I'm, I'm material. I'm visible. I occupy space. I'm composed of something. Uh, that's totally different than what God is. Um, there's no analogy of that in me. So that's how we separate. Sometimes you'll hear people talk about the incommunicable and the communicable attributes, and that's what they're distinguishing. Those divine attributes are perfections which have no analogy in the creature that, ab that emphasize the absolute distinctness of God, his transcendent greatness. Um, and so those things are, are those things that are emphasizing how unique God is, as one commentator put it. The communicable attributes are those attributes which the attributes of man bear some analogy. Of course, in God, they're all, they're all infinite and perfect, whereas in us they are all finite and imperfect, uh, but we understand something of them. And so we could just go through this list of attributes together and think about these things that are about God. I mean, all of these, we, we could spend individual sermons talking about each one of these, um, but taken as a whole, I think, is helpful for us to, to consider uh, the attributes of God. Um, God is eternal. Uh, God is eternal. Um, he is uh, infinite in relation to time. He has no beginning or end. He does not dwell in time. He's actually over time. Um, he is not bound by it. He is, sometimes we try to say God is eternally present. Um, he's present in every time at the same time. The, and all kinds of things, when we talk about these sorts of attributes, we eventually get to what I call the, the, the point at which our mind breaks. Um, the, the point at which we say, all right, now I can't, it hurts my brain to think about this because how can you be eternally present in every time but not be in time? Um, you're, you're, you're not bound by time at all. You're sovereign over time. That's what it means that God is eternal. It's his infinity um, in relation to time. He is a God of endless duration. Uh, he has no beginning. He has no end. He does not dwell in time. Psalm 90 verse 2 says, Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Or Psalm 102 verse 12, But you, O Lord, are enthroned forever. You are remembered throughout all generations. A theme picked up in Ephesians 3.21, To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Uh, God transcends time and possesses the whole of himself all at once. There is to him only an eternal present, no past and no future. Uh, God is eternal, and it's no surprise that the next thing we say is he is incomprehensible. Um, we might say he is incomprehensible in his eternity. It's impossible to understand how he really can be eternally present and not bound by time. He's incomprehensible. He cannot be known unless he reveals himself to us. Um, Job 11, 7 and 8, we read, can you find out the deep things of God? Can you find out the limit of the Almighty? It is higher than heaven. What can you do? It is deeper than Sheol. What can you know? He's incomprehensible. Um, Isaiah 40, 18 says, To whom then will you liken God? Or what likeness compare with him? He is incomprehensible in himself. 
He's only knowable as he reveals himself to us. Um, We cannot understand him any other way than he's revealed himself to us. He's incomprehensible and he's invisible. That's also one of the reasons that you can't comprehend God. uh, Because he is invisible. Um, Jesus is called in in Colossians 1.15 the image of the invisible God. Um, the firstborn of all creation. Uh, that's one of the arguments against any representation of God through idols. Any kind, of, any kind of making of an image of God is not to be done. And why? Well, Deuteronomy 4.12, God says, the Lord's, we're told the Lord spoke to you out of the midst of the fire. You heard the sound of words, but saw no form. There was only a voice. That's why God hates idolatry. It's to take that which is invisible and to reduce it to the visible. Um, God is to be worshipped in spirit and in truth as the invisible God, not by means of idols. He's eternal, he's incomprehensible, he's invisible, he's unchangeable. He's immutable, we sometimes say. God does not and cannot change. Uh, God always is and will always be who he is. He is forever the same. And therefore, as one commentator put it, devoid of all change in his being, his perfections, his purposes, and his promises. James says in James 1.17, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. He is unchangeable. Psalm 102 celebrates that fact Twenty-six in verses 26 and 27. They will perish, but you will remain. They will all wear out like a garment. You will change them like a robe and they will pass away. But you are the same and your years have no end. Um, one of the great hopes that's held out to the people of God in the Old Testament is, I, the Lord, do not change, therefore you are not consumed. I don't change. I don't change with respect to my being, to my perfections, to my purposes, and to my promises. Praise God that we have an unchangeable God who is unchangeable and infinite. Everything that belongs to God is without measure or quantity. He is infinite as to his perfection. And this infinitude qualifies all of his incommunicable attributes. So, for example, God is infinite in his love. He's infinite in his goodness. He's infinite in his justice. Uh, None of those things have measure or quantity. When God says to us, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I've continued my faithfulness towards you. It's an infinite love. It it not only is infinite with respect to time, it's infinite with respect to quality, to measure. There's no way to measure the love of God for his people. Um, That's Paul's prayer, that you would come to understand the unsearchable, the height and the depth and the breadth of the love of God. Um, It's without quantity or measure. He's infinite in his love, infinite in his goodness, infinite in his justice. All of these things he possesses without measure or quantity. He's infinite in his power. He is almighty. We sometimes call this his omnipotence. It just means he is unlimited in his power. There too, it's, we, we, we can understand something about being mighty. Right? We, we can see someone at the gym lifting a lot of weights and say, that's a, that's a powerful person. They can lift a lot of weight. Um, but the, there's no limit to the might of our God. He, he, you, you can't say, you know, how much can God lift? Because God can lift more than there is. Um, you cannot measure or quantify his power. 
Uh, that's why, as we saw this morning in, in the psalm, why it's so foolish to oppose an almighty God. He has all power in himself. There is no limit to his power. You cannot quantify his power. It's beyond our ability to trace out. That's why God can, through the mere exercise of his will, realize whatever he's decided to accomplish. That's why as the psalmist is singing all the various praises of God, where we see his power being manifest in his creation, um, says, you know, in verse 32, he only has to look at the earth and it trembles. Why? Because it's, it's the gaze of the infinitely almighty God. He only has to look at the earth and it's trembling. He only has to touch, it, touch the mountains and they smoke. That's the, the power of God. Job says when we consider all the great things that God has made and the amazing power that it takes to be able to say, let there be, and it springs into existence at the power of your word. Job says we can look around at all that and still say we're only seeing the outskirts of his power. You can look at the whole greatness of creation from the greatness of the universe to the smallness of the microscopic things that God has made. You can think about all of that greatness and say, you know what? That is just the outskirt of what he's capable of. Job says that's the whisper of his power. If he were to shout, what would happen? We have no idea what that voice is capable of. Because all that we see and all that we understand of the greatness of his creation, all that he does, all that he did in its, in its management that's spelled out in Psalm 104, that's a whisper of his power. You still come nowhere close to understanding what it is that God is in his infinite, almighty self. It's just something we can celebrate and get some small understanding of. Romans 1.20 says we can look, as Psalm 104 does, to the creation and get some understanding. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For Psalm 115, 3, our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. Jeremiah 32, 17, ah, Lord God, it is you who has made the heavens and the earth by your great power and by your outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. Or Ephesians 1, 19 and 20, what is the immeasurable greatness of his power? Toward us who believe, according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places. And if he desired, he could do much more than everything he's brought to pass. He could do much more than he's done in the creation of all things, in the redemption of things, in the providential care he exercises. He's capable of doing far more than that. If that does not make us want to throw ourselves at the feet of Almighty God, I don't know what can. What encouragement should we draw from the fact that he has used that almighty power on our behalf in Christ Jesus to raise him from the dead? Our God is an almighty God. Our God is completely wise. Our God is completely wise. Not only does he have all the power to do things, he's completely wise in the way he does things. When we think about the complete wisdom of God, what are we thinking of? I like how one commentator put it. He said, it's the intelligence of God as manifested in the adaption of means to ends. What he means by that is God, by his complete wisdom, chooses the best means for attaining the goals that he has in view. Right? So when God wants to do something, he doesn't just do it in a way that accomplishes the purpose. He does it in the best way that accomplishes the purpose. He shows complete wisdom in everything that he's done. 
Um, the psalmist also praises that in Psalm 104, verse 24. Oh Lord, how manifold are your works. In wisdom you've made them all. Right? God has chosen the best possible means to attain the goals that he has in view. Um, the final end, which is the glory of his name and the good of his people. Um, he's managed to bring all of that together in the best means he can by his creation, his redemption, and his sanctification. That's why when we consider the works of God, we can only conclude that he does all things by his complete wisdom that are beyond us. Romans 11.33, Oh, the depths of the riches and wisdom of the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. Ephesians 1, 11 and 12. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who are the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. He's worked all things according to the counsel of his will, a completely wise will. For by him all things were created, Colossians 1, 16, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. Christ is the wisdom of God. He's completely wise. He's just. He's holy and righteous in all that he does. He maintains himself over and against every violation of his holiness and shows himself in every respect that he is the Holy One. He imposes a just law with a just consequence, promises of reward for obedience, and threats of punishment for disobedience. He is a just God. And he is good and the overflowing fountain of all good. He is just and he's good. Uh, God's goodness is not only God's goodness in himself, but God's goodness in action. Um, he's good in himself and he's good in all that he does. That's why we say he's good and the overflowing fountain of all good. Um, he's good in himself and he's good in action, which reveals himself in doing well to others. Uh, one commentator said, we can define the goodness of God, that goodness and overflowing goodness, as that perfection of God which prompts him to deal bounteously and kindly with all his creatures. It is the affection which the creature, fe the creator feels toward the creatures he's made as such. And we, we see that in, in, the, in, the, in the bounteousness of the creation, the kindness of creation, that, that as we've said before, we don't have a bread and water God. We have a God who has punctuated his creation with every example of the way he has bounteously dealt with things, the way he has kindly dealt with things. Um, that he, he formed the water, not just so that man could go to and forth on the water with ships, but he, he filled the water with creatures and he formed certain creatures to play in the water. I've had the privilege of going to, to Hawaii and seeing spinner dolphins that, that spin through the water. They kind of spin like barrel rolling through the water and they jump out of the water and they do all sorts of things. And you just, you watch them and you say, they're just playing out there. Or if you're at the beach and have, have the privilege of seeing, you know, dolphins sort of body surfing in the surf, they just look like they're playing out there. And whales seem to do that too. And, and we just think not only has God made this wonderful world, but he's made the ocean so that they can play in it. Um, he, he's made the world interesting and wonderful. That he, He's made the world understandable and, and all in a graciousness to us. Um, and he, he's bounteous and kind to everything that he's made. Right? He's not an imperious God. Not like, you know, some dignities in, in the world that Everyone has to bow and scrape before, but this is a God who is not just great, but good. You know, that, that's one of the sad 
differences between the false religion of Islam and the true religion of Christianity. They have a God who's great, but is, he's arbitrary. And the, and the best thing they can confess about their God is that he's great. Allah Akbar, God is great. You know, the wonderful thing that we confess about our God is that the Lord is good. It's one of the great differences. We don't just have a God who is imperiously great and who you never know where you stand before him. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. And his steadfast love endures forever. That's the fundamental praise of God's people. We have a God who's good, who deals bounteously with the creatures and the creation that he's made. Psalm 36, 6 says, Your righteousness is like the mountains of God. Your judgments are like the great deep. Man and beast you save, O Lord. Psalm 145, 9 says, The Lord is good to all, and his mercy is over all that he has made. Jesus celebrates the fact in Matthew 5, 45, for he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. He leaves a witness to his goodness in the world. And to the people of Lystra, it said in Acts 14, 17, yet he did not leave himself without a witness, for he did good by giving you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and with gladness. God deals kindly and, gen and bounteously to all his creatures. He is good, and he's the overflowing fountain of all good. Do you see why we spend time going through these things? Because it tells us something about our God. It tells us something more about the God we serve, and that we can learn more and more about him not just from his word, but from the world that he's made that testifies to his eternal power and to his divine nature. And so next time, Lord willing, we'll spend more time thinking about how we know this God. Well, let's meditate on this God that we believe in and confess with our mouths, who is all of these things. To him be the glory forevermore. Amen. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you for revealing something of yourself to us. We know there are many things about you that we cannot fully comprehend or understand, that we must simply fall before you and praise your name. But we thank you, Lord, that we can call you God and know that you are the high and exalted one, but that you are our God. You've covenanted with us and made us your Father in the Lord Jesus Christ. And how thankful we are to know that your greatness is revealed in your word and in your world so that we can know many great things about you. And so where there are limits to our knowledge, Lord, we pray that we would simply stand in awe of you. And what we can understand about you, we pray that that would cause us more and more to worship and magnify your name for being this great God, who is our God, for the sake of Christ. Hear us, we pray in his name. Amen. Well, people of God, it's been good to spend this time with you and meditating on the perfections and the names of our God. And so this God whose name and whose perfections we know leaves us with his blessing. So dearly loved people of God, lift up your hearts to this Lord and receive now his blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. People of God, go in peace until we meet again.